Well, welcome to Hope Church. It's a blessing for us to be able to gather together, even when we're separated into different rooms. It is something, it's something precious, it's a privilege to join together in the worship of God. And I hope one of the sort of lessons of the lockdown time we've gone through is how much we missed being able to meet together. And that's the reason why we need to remember those churches that are still not able to do that today. And in that context, let's look at these words from Psalm 42. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Those are strong words, aren't they? Speaks of a deer that is thirsty, maybe being chased by some sort of predator. And the psalmist here speaks of his soul being thirsty. Well, there's nothing more overwhelming than a sort of raging thirst. Perhaps it's something we've never really experienced. If you've been without water for a couple of days in the desert, that's the sort of thing I'm talking about. And he's saying that is what describes his thirst for God. We need water, don't we, for life. Without water, we die. Well, he's pretty much saying it's the same with God. Without God, we die. But he talks here about meeting with God. And and it's it's a bit of a strange thing, because you think, well, isn't God everywhere? Surely he can meet with God anytime. You know, the psalmist can pray. They can sing. They can maybe read or at least remember God's word, think about that. You can do all of that on your own. But what he seems to have in mind here is about being able to meet together with God's people to worship. It seems that the psalmist, if you read the rest of the psalm, he's away from home. He's maybe running from enemies. He's cut off from the public worship of God's people. And that is something very painful for him. It's a loss. And he's saying, you know, when can I meet with God, when can I meet with his people? And that tells us something about how precious this time should be. Because, of course, all of our life is worship. All of our life, uh, we are to worship God in all that we do, in our work, at home, in our leisure. God is present everywhere. We can serve him in every circumstance. And yet, when we gather together as his people, as his family, Jesus is present in a different way by his spirit to speak to us. It's about what he's present to do. He's ministering to us through his word. He's uniting us together in him. There is something special about what we are doing. And so even though we can't meet as we would like, we can't uh, engage together in the way we would like, we can't sing and all these other things, Even so, what we are doing is so precious that even, as it were, almost the crumbs of a sort of modified service are like a feast for us as God's people. So how can we ever want to stay away from this? I don't understand Christians that don't want to meet together with God's people. You're missing out on enormous blessing. Let's look at these words of uh, two, two songs, first of all. As the deer pants for the water, based on this psalm, So my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Does that express your heart this morning? Let's look at two verses of another hymn. Maybe let's let's stand while I I read uh, this hymn to us. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Come bow before him now with reverence and fear. In him no sin is found. We stand on holy ground. Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. Be still, for the power of the Lord is moving in this place. He comes to cleanse and heal, to minister his grace. No work too hard for him, in faith receive from him. Be still, for the power of the Lord 
is moving in this place. Well, please sit down. God is at work amongst us. So let's uh, come to him now in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you that we can meet with you together this morning. We thank you that we can be still before you. We can draw aside from all the other things we've been doing and thinking about and come together to worship you. And Lord, we come to worship you because we are not God. We are people that need you. You don't need us. And yet, astonishingly, you welcome us. You delight to hear our voice as your children as we cry out to you this morning. We praise you that you are our God. We praise you that you are a God of grace, the one who has rescued us from sin and death. That we are a people forgiven through blood, the death, the sacrifice of your Son, our Saviour the Lord Jesus. We pray that that great fact of our salvation would be the bedrock of our lives. As we reflect on what Jesus has done for us on the cross, may that make us absolutely certain that we are a people who are loved. When we're tempted to wonder what's going on maybe in our lives and to question all sorts of things, may we never question that. May we never question that we are loved by you. May we be certain that you will never stop doing us good. And we pray, Lord, that you would do us good afresh this morning. We pray that we would hear your voice, that you would reveal your Son to us by your Spirit this morning. Speak to us from your word. Give us hearts to hear that, to receive that, and to respond to that, and to be changed by your word. May this time be precious. And we pray that you would minister to us, that you would equip us for all that we need in the days ahead. Help us with the concerns, the burdens of today, of this week, of whatever changes and uncertainty that maybe are hanging over us. We pray that we would know your promise and your presence in whatever we may face. May we prove you at this time. May we prove the reality of what it means to follow you. May you minister to us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Right, I've got a little uh, quiz for you. We've got to guess <coughs> who I'm talking about from the Bible. So here are some things about the person I'm, I'm thinking of here. He was someone that was a, a shepherd. So any, any thought, who, who, might, who could that be in the Bible? Any thoughts, yeah? David, David yeah, that's a good, good answer, yeah? Known as a shepherd. Any other, any other shepherds in the Bible? Indeed, Jesus, yeah, yeah, that's all good, yeah, there's, there's actually some more, but anyway, okay, second thing, here's a murderer. Well, actually, that could still be David, couldn't it? Um, think back to a few weeks ago, but we're not actually talking about, this isn't David, okay, who I'm talking about here. Uh, he was part of a royal family, part of a ruling family. Oh, interesting. Okay, right. You're, you're, uh, you're on the right track. He was a reluctant leader. He didn't really want to take on the job that God had for him. It is Moses. Um, let me give you, you're doing very well, a stonemason. Why do I say he was a stonemason? Well, he was told to chisel out these. <laughs> wouldn't he? The, uh, the, the tablets that, remember, this is incredible, the, the Ten Commandments had God's handwriting, okay? The, the, it was, the words inscribed were in God's handwriting, uh, but the stone was cut out by Moses. He was told to do that. 
And here's, here's I should put this one first. Um, he came out of an ark, which was meant to sort of confuse everyone. Notice I haven't said the ark, okay, because we're not talking about Noah's family. We're talking about what happened to Moses at the start of his life, where he was, um, it puts it in, in, I think, our version, he was put in a basket, which gives totally the wrong um, impression. It wasn't a basket. The word that is used is the same word that's used of Noah's ark. Okay, so the thing that, that Moses was placed in was called an ark. It was coated with pitch, just like the ark, and it had a lid on it. The whole point was it was meant to be a place of protection, just like the ark was. So it was something quite substantial. It wasn't some sort of flimsy basket they shoved this baby in. It was something um, meant to protect him, which is exactly what it did. And they had to open the lid to get Moses out. So think of that. It's a good one for a, for a quiz sometime. Moses came out of an ark. So that's, that's we're going to think a bit more about Moses' life, but we're going to read about how his life ended. We're going to read from Deuteronomy 34. This is speaking about Moses' uh, death, and then we're going to think a little bit more about his life. So Deuteronomy 34. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan, all of Naphtali, the territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the Western Sea, the Negev and the whole region from the Valley of Jericho, the City of Palms, as far as Zor. That's interesting, isn't it? That's the name of our, our chapel. But I don't think he was seeing this building. Then the Lord said to him, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then... No prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Moses was an absolutely incredible person. Shown there the whole land that God was going to give to the Israelites. But let's look at how his life panned out, because um, he died when he was 120 years old. Did you notice there? He's, uh, he still had his, his strength, verse 7, 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. But he, was, he died at this point because he was not allowed to go into the promised land because of how he had actually disobeyed God earlier on. So let's look at the life of Moses, and it neatly divides into three, okay? 120 years old, when he died, it divides into three equal sections. So if you're good at maths, you can work out how long the sections are. First section, from when he was born to when he was about 40. Remember, he was born part of the Israelites. They were slaves in Egypt at this time. And he was born at a time where the Pharaoh had said that the Israelite baby boy should be killed. That's why his mum put him in this ark, put him in the river, was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. And this, I think, is, is incredible. They'd worked it all out so that Pharaoh's daughter ends up asking Moses' actual mother to look after him and actually says, and I'll pay you to do it. I mean, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? You actually paid to be a mother. 
That's what God worked out to rescue Moses. And as he grew up, he was brought up, it says, as Pharaoh's um, um, Pharaoh's daughter treated Moses as if he was her own child. So he was educated like one of the royal family. He was part of that sort of um, ruling court. I think that's quite handy, isn't it? He was being... He was learning about how a nation like Egypt was being led. He was seeing it at first hand, some of the the ways, the things that were going on, learning about all the way of Egyptian thinking. And yet he knew he was an Israelite. And when he was about 40 years old, it seems he thought, well, maybe it's my job to rescue the Israelites. And he sees an Egyptian beating up an Israelite. And so he intervenes and he kills the Egyptian. That's why we say he was a murderer. He killed that Egyptian, but then people found out about it. He got scared. He had to flee. And he didn't end up being the rescuer of Israel in the way that he thought. And it seemed at this point as if everything had gone wrong in his life. He had a you know, great upbringing, but it had all gone wrong. And the next 40 years of his life were all rather samey because he was living um, outside of Egypt. He found a wife, he had two sons, and he basically worked as a shepherd for 40 years. Leading sheep in the wilderness with not a lot changing. That was going to be quite handy, wasn't it, for the future? And it's at the end of that time, when he's 80 years old, when it seems like his life has been wasted, that God says, now you're ready for the work I've called you to do. And it's when he's 80, God meets him at the burning bush. And he says, I'm sending you to lead my people out of Egypt. And Moses thinks, I don't want to do this. I don't want to go to Pharaoh and say, basically, I'm leading a rebellion You can understand he wasn't wanting to do that. He found all sorts of excuses. He said, oh, I can't do this. You know, send someone else. I can't speak. God says, I will give you everything you need. God says he'll equip Moses. He will give him all the gifts and the help that he needs. All those things he learned growing up would come in useful now as he went to confront Pharaoh. And uh, it would take all day to go through the rest of the story, wouldn't it? But he leads the Israelites out of Egypt. He leads them... In, um, into the desert, they meet with God. God gives them his, his commandments. He leads them through the desert for 40 years. An incredible life of serving God. So what are the lessons for us? Well, when you become a Christian, when you ask Jesus to forgive you for your sin. You are not simply asking for forgiveness. You are saying, have my life. You're, we sometimes put it in, terms of, in this way, don't we? You are giving your life to God. Well, that is exactly what you're doing when you become a Christian. You're saying, I no longer have the rights over my life. My life is in your hands, God, to use as you wish. And sometimes, as you then go through your life, you will think, what on earth is God doing here? Well, be encouraged by Moses. Think how he must have felt. I think we actually get a hint of it in Psalm 90, in those, um, those years leading up to his uh, 80th birthday. What's happened to my life? What's the point? This all seems a terrible waste. But it was all part of God's perfect plan. And God will equip you for whatever he wants you to do. You can be certain of that. So be encouraged by Moses' life. But think about who Moses points to. Moses was someone very great. This is what we read earlier. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses' face actually shone because he spoke to God directly. And it says there was no one else ever like him. And yet, Moses got things wrong. Moses failed. That's why he couldn't go in to the new land. 
So listen to what Moses himself said. He said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers, an Israelite. You must listen to him. And yet before it said, there's never been a prophet like Moses. And Moses is saying, ah, oh, there's going to be someone that's going to come that's a bit like me, but far greater than me. Listen to him. And of course, he's talking there about Jesus Christ. Moses, in Moses at his best, we see a little picture of what Jesus is like. You see, Jesus is the saviour who rescues us not from slavery in Egypt, but the slavery of sin. He is the one who, who um, provides for us in every situation. He is the leader that we need. He is the perfect leader that never gets anything wrong. So as we look at Moses, remember who he points to. He points to someone greater. He, Jesus Christ, is the leader that we need. And we're going to be thinking later about the the leader that um, Moses hands on to. But first of all, I want us to to pray again. And thinking there about about leaders, I want us to pray for the church in France. We've we've shared um, in the prayer news about uh, this pastor, Ed Nelson, uh, of a church in Paris who died tragically in a climbing accident a few weeks ago. He's he's a young man. He has a wife and four children. He's been uh, an influential preacher, training up other workers in France. It's a massive setback and shock for the church there. So let's, let's pray uh, for, for the church, for the family. And let's also pray for uh, Maxime and Demelza in Bordeaux. It's a church that we seek to support. Uh, Maxime isn't at all well at the moment. Let's pray for him. And pray for the work of that church. And and there's an encouragement in this too, because just very recently, um, a a lady has become a Christian there in Bordeaux. And that's the most encouraging news you can always have, isn't it? Um, So let's pray that there'll be lots more news like that for them in the days ahead. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can pour out our hearts honestly to you in prayer. We can come to you when we don't understand. We can come to you when we're grieving, when we're in shock. And that is our response to the news of Ed Nelson's death. We don't understand. We can't see how this can be a good thing in your purposes. What, what, how can this be of help to your kingdom? We don't understand, but we trust you, Lord. And we ask, Father, that you would provide, that you would work out your good purpose in this situation. We pray that you would provide for the immediate family. We pray for his wife, Laura. We pray for the children, Nicholas, Samuel, Alexandra, and Lucy. Help them, Father, as they move past the initial shock to the daily realization that their husband, their father, is not there and he won't be coming back. We pray, Father, that you would help them each day in facing that. We pray, Lord, that they would prove your comfort and strength and help the church, Lord, in their grief, in their loss. We pray, Father, help those seeking to minister in that fellowship, We pray for all the others around France who have been so um, saddened and shocked by this. We pray, Father, that even through this, it would redouble their efforts to serve you. We pray that you would raise up more gospel workers. We pray that others would take on this task and would um, see the need of training your people and of raising up new leaders. And we pray in particular for the church in Bordeaux. We pray for, uh, for Maxime and Demelza. We pray for Maxime that you would help him to be able to rest at this time. We pray for his health to be restored. We pray that there would be others that could take on tasks from him that he would not fear 
as it were, for the, for the work of the church, that he would be able to trust you in that. And we pray, Father, that you would restore him. Raise up new leaders in that fellowship. Help those that have come to work as apprentices. And we thank you, Father, for this new Christian. We thank you for the encouragement of this lady that has come to trust you. After 10 years of being prayed for and spoken to, we thank you that you have brought her into your kingdom at this time. We pray that you would help her to go on in her faith. And we pray that there would be many more encouragements like that in the days ahead of others who have come to trust you. We pray, Lord, build your church in France. Establish your kingdom there. Save many in that land. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's read from God's word again. And we're going to look at uh, Joshua chapter 1. And if you are going through a Bible or even on your Bible app, it follows on directly from the passage we just read before. We don't often make the connections between books, but it actually follows directly on from what we just read before. So let's read this together now. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I'm about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord God will be with you wherever you go. It's a command there to be strong and courageous. And it reminded me of uh, this song, Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. I wonder, can we just stand again? And I want to pray briefly. As uh, I'm just conscious it's the start of a new uh, term. Um, some of us here are going to be returning to school. Let's pray that we would be bold and strong as we do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do not give us an empty command. You do not just tell us to um, somehow be different. You give us reasons why we can be strong and courageous, why we can have this boldness. And we can have this because of what you have promised, because of your presence among us. And we want to pray that you would help those returning to school this week, returning in the midst of um, very different circumstances, in the midst of continuing uncertainty. And that alongside all the normal um, stresses and everything else of, of being back at school. We do pray, Father, that you would uh, watch over the children and young people. We pray that you would direct their path. We pray that you would help them to know what is right, to know what is true. We pray, Lord, that they would know the truth from your word. And we pray, Father, that they would want to follow you, even when it's costly, even when it's hard, even when um, you might be the only one that is ready to do what is right. We pray that you would strengthen them. And may they find their help in you 
May you direct their paths and may you raise up a new generation, even from amongst us here, a new generation who will wholeheartedly follow the Lord, who will be able to lead your people in the days ahead, who will put those of us here now to shame because of their zeal and their uh, obedience and, and, and service of you. Father, we pray, watch over our young people, protect them, and we pray use them in these days. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to come back to um, that passage in Joshua. B.C. and A.C., before coronavirus, after coronavirus. Well, back in March, uh, there was a contemporary historian, Peter Hennessy, who said that's how historians in the future will sort of look back and, and divide the times that we live in. He was saying that this whole virus crisis is a turning point in history, and, and used this term B.C. and A.C., well, in some ways, I think that might be a slight exaggeration. But I think it is absolutely true that the impact of what has happened and what is still happening will be very long and deep. The impact on people's lives, the economic impact, the impact on jobs, on health, on education, on families. Whatever the normal is that we return to, it will be very different to the normal that we knew pre-virus. In other words, we are in for change. We've seen a lot of change, and there's going to continue to be a lot of change. And change is not always welcome. And it means there will be change for the church as well. And I don't simply mean in the terms of the sort of the practical things of, of physically how we have to meet and that sort of thing. I mean the whole context in which we are ministering in is going to be changing. And I want to reassure you that there is nothing new in that. The church has always had to adapt to changing circumstances. We tend to think, oh no, we're the first people to have to face certain problems. Absolute rubbish. The church has always had to face radically changing situations. I've been reading a book over the summer about how the church has responded, the church across the world has had to respond to change back through the 19th century in the midst of all sorts of political upheaval, where sometimes the place of the church in the society could totally change. In the midst of economic turmoil, the whole way work changed in the Industrial Revolution, the social changes that occurred as people uh, migrated to cities, and most people ended up living in cities, that changed the way the church had to minister because many of those people were living in horrendous living conditions and poverty. So you had to rethink, how can we reach these people? Because often people were so ill and tired after having to work such long hours, there's no way they were ever going to come to a church on a Sunday. How are you going to minister in that situation? And of course there were intellectual changes, there were new ideas. The questioning of the Bible that changed the way people heard the message. Never think there was some sort of golden age in the past. You know, there's very little new in some of the challenges we face today. The church has always had to adapt to change. And you actually see it in the Bible. You see it as you look at the life of Israel. We're going to look at, uh, in a moment at the great change that was happening as Joshua takes over from Moses and as they start to conquer the land. But that's just one example of change in the life of Israel. The whole history of Israel is one of change. After the conquest, they went through this uh, hundreds of years of chaos, really, with the lives of the judges. You went through the time of the, the kings of David and Solomon and some of the stability that brought. And then you had all the different kings afterwards in the changes that occurred then. 
You had the exile into Babylon and then the return from Babylon that we were thinking about um, a few weeks ago from Ezra 3. And then silence, as we heard about last week, for centuries. No prophets, nothing, waiting for Jesus to come. And that reminds us that sometimes the change we have to encounter is things staying the same. Sometimes that's the change. Sometimes we have to get to used to actually not a lot happening. That's the change we encounter. But all of those different situations were very different situations within which to serve God. And it's the same for us as individuals, isn't it? Our individual lives are lived in the midst of constant change. We've just thought about the new school year. Well, this school year is going to be a bit different, isn't it? Aside from all the differences there are normally, is you have new classes, new teachers, maybe a new school, um, and it seems every year there's some new exam system or grading system or something people have to get used to. Some will be going to university. That's another change. Maybe the working environment has changed. Working more at home, maybe you've lost your job. Maybe even the whole industry that you worked in has disappeared. And there's changes in our health, in our family. You know, there's some change that just is, is a natural part of growing up, isn't it? Children get older. We know bereavement. Loved ones die. And the most basic change is we are all getting older. That's change. We're all facing it all the time. And it's in that context I want us to take seriously God's command here to Joshua to be strong and courageous. He's telling Joshua to be strong and courageous in the midst of change. And I want us to look at this chapter, these first nine verses, to see if you like how we can be strong and courageous in the midst of change. The reason, if you like, you can embrace change if you're a Christian. If you're trusting Christ, if you're not, I think what you're going to see is what you're missing out on in all the changes that we face. There is massive encouragement here for God's people in the change that we encounter. But we need to understand, if you like, why there is change. What I've called here the context of change. We need to understand that we are in a fallen world. Change happens, if you like, in the context of failure. There's a wonderful realism in the Bible. And I love the way, in verse 2, it begins... In this way, this is how, how God's, God's direct words to, to, to Joshua begin like this. Moses, my servant, is dead. This is meant to be some great motivational speech, isn't it? What a great way to begin. Moses, my servant, is dead. Okay, to start, isn't it? Well, why is he dead? Well, one reason is that he's a sinner in a sinful world, and sinners in, sin, in a sinful world all die. But there's something a bit more specific, I think, with Moses. Why isn't he leading, why is he dying at this point? Why is he not leading the people into the new land? That was the original plan. We're told he was 120 years old, but still healthy. Well, the problem was that for all his greatness, he had disobeyed God. God wasn't letting him lead the people into the land. You can read about it in Numbers chapter 20. Why? Because he didn't live out God's grace. He wasn't as patient with the people as God was. I think that's actually what he did wrong. So they needed a new leader. And it would have been very easy for the people to sort of cling to Moses. He was, you know, one of the greatest leaders of people ever. Think of what he'd done in taking them out of Egypt. The fact that he you know, spoke to God face to face. Well, they needed to understand that they should not trust in any human leader. However great, however gifted, Moses was gone. He was dead. And also, the people that came out of Egypt were also dead. Remember that this, what was happening here, going into the new land, was meant to have happened 39 years earlier. 
But again, those people had disobeyed God. That generation had died. They'd spent 40 years in the wilderness. They'd known 40 years, if you like, of no change. It was this context of failure. Why begin here? This hardly seems encouraging. Well, I think it helps us to understand why we sometimes fear change. I think we're very conscious of failure. You see, if even Moses went wrong, how can we be sure that Joshua is going to be any better? If the Israelites were unfaithful in the desert, how are we any different? And it's very easy to look back at maybe our own failures, things that went wrong for us in the past, maybe your own sin, but maybe also bad experiences you had that, that weren't your fault, as it were, things that happened to you. And it can fill you with fear. You know, why should the future be any different, given what happened in the past? And I think we can also be, have this sort of consciousness of what it seems we've lost. Understand that for the Israelites, life in the desert was not all bad. You know, they were fed with bread from heaven. But we were told they had shoes and clothes that didn't wear out. I mean, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? They had God living amongst them. He had his tent pitched amongst them. You know, life in the desert was not so bad. And so you can understand why they might think, well, actually, maybe we should stay where we are. Things aren't too bad here. Yes, there's problems. But we would prefer to stay as we are. And I think we can very much have the same way of thinking. We can prefer what we used to, even though it, we recognize there's problems. We prefer having that than having to trust God for something new. We can be comfortable where we are. And I think there can be something even deeper going on. I think at a sort of subconscious level, as sinners, we always carry a sense of what we've lost, of what, as it were, might have been. We remember that humanity began in paradise. There's that consciousness in all of us. There's that longing for paradise. And let's face it, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, when they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden, thrown out of that paradise, there was an awful lot of traumatic change, wasn't there? Changes in their bodies, in their relationships, in their environment. And I think as a result, we have an instinctive fear of change. We associate change with God's judgment. It must be something bad. God's trying to harm me. God's trying to take something away. It's actually one of the things that stops people becoming Christians. To become a Christian involves a massive change, doesn't it? And we fear that change. People are afraid of what they will lose if they become a Christian. They would prefer to hold on to the way of life they have, even if they may see it has problems. But they prefer that to the change of giving their lives to God. But that makes a fundamental mistake. We need to realize that the change that God promises here is a good change. The answer to those fears that we have about change are the promises that God gives here. You see, God is promising to give change to the people of Israel as they go into this new land. God promises to give change when you become a Christian precisely because we are in a fallen world, precisely because we are in a mess, and God is doing something about it. God is working to undo the damage, to redeem. God is a God of change who starts where we are, who starts in the mess and failure we're in, and takes us to a better place. And that involves change. But we have to trust that the change that God is bringing is good, because God is good. That is what his promise is all about. And that's the second thing we have here. God is promising something very wonderful. Back in verses uh, 3 and 4, he says, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. And he so seeks to describe the land that they will inherit. 
You had this back in the previous chapter, Deuteronomy 34. God talks about, um, in verse 4, this is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were to go forward because God was giving them the land, a good land, a land where they would be at home, a land where they could be at rest. Now, that doesn't mean it would all be easy. God was giving them the land, but they would still have to fight. There were plenty of battles ahead, but fundamentally, God was giving them something good. This was good change. And it was actually even better than they could have realized. Because if you look back to what God promised Abraham, maybe 600 years earlier, if you read that in Genesis, you discover that God was not simply giving the Israelites a land. It was about preserving the nation so that, that through that nation, the whole world could be blessed. It was actually an outworking of a promise gave, that God gave even before that, right at the start of history. In Genesis 3.15, the day that Adam fell, God promised a child would be born who would be a saviour. And if you like Israel's history, all those changes we talked about are all about fulfilling that promise. That Jesus would be born as a descendant of Abraham. That he would be the saviour. That's really what's going on here. That's what all the Old Testament history is about. It's about making way for Jesus to come. That was God's plan. But all, this, all Joshua and the Israelites could see was actually a lifetime of battle, a lifetime of battle against formidable enemies. That's all they could see on their horizon. But God's plan stretched far bigger. So what's the lessons for us in that? Well, God's promise is bigger than your comfort. What I mean by this is that the good change that God promises won't necessarily make your life easy. It will be hard work. It will be painful. Because the change that God has in view is conforming you to the image of his son. To be like Jesus. And the end that he has in view is not rest in this life. It is the new creation to come. The new creation that this very promise of the land pointed to. In other words, the promises that God gives are not, if you like, about you as an individual. But they're about God's whole plan of salvation in which you can play a part, in which you can share. It's not ultimately about your plans. God's promise is bigger than your comfort, and God's promise is longer than your life. If the promise God was giving here was fundamentally about a saviour being born, then the conquest of the land, fighting all of these battles that they had in store, would be a small part of working that out small part of working out a plan that would be fulfilled centuries later. It's the same for us. Fundamentally, it means it's not about you. Your career, your family, or even for that matter, Hope Church. It's about God's kingdom. And if you like, it's about how your career, your family, Hope Church and everything else fits into that into that bigger plan, that bigger purpose. And what you do now may seem irrelevant, it may seem wasted, but you have no idea how God will use what you are doing now, the place that God will take you. Maybe that's a purpose that will only become clear centuries later, long after you are dead. But that's okay, because we trust in God's goodness. Think of how uh, God has sometimes intervened in an, in, in an individual's life. Think of someone like the evangelist D.L. Moody. Someone spoke to him about the gospel. A small act in a Christian life, if you like. And then God used someone like D.L. Moody to save thousands through 
his preaching. You never know how God will work. So that's the context, if you like, of change. Why there needs to be change. Why we can be confident in change. And that's the second thing here. This, this, this confidence in change. What, what are the reasons we're given here for why we can be confident in the midst of change? There's nothing dreary about God's message here. God is giving reasons to counter the anxiety that is associated with change. And the first thing we have here is God's direction. He says in verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it from the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. God is giving direction. That is what gives us confidence. When I go to a new place, one of the first things I want is a map. And I mean a real map, not some sat-nav thing that just shows you the sort of little bit where you are and gives you no feel of the whole... um, context where you're in. I want to know where I'm going. And if I don't know quite where I'm going or how I'm going to get there, I'll get very anxious. It's very unsettling. And of course, you also, it's not, you also need to know where you're starting from, don't you? That's the whole point of the map. You know, you are here. You know where you're clear where you're starting from. You're clear where you're trying to get to. You're clear how you're going to get there. Well, that is basically what the book of the law does. It's referring to what we think of as the books of Genesis through to Deuteronomy, those first five books of the Bible. But maybe in particular the book of Deuteronomy, these words that Moses gave at the end of his life, almost a summary of all of that. But don't get confused by this word law. The book of the law is not a list of random rules. It is more a sort of celebration of a relationship. The law includes a record of experiences, shared experiences. If you like, it's a record of how we got here, what God has done. And it also sets out a pattern for a shared life. You know, this is where we're going together. It's sort of a blueprint for a happy life together. That's really what the law is all about. So it includes all those promises that God has given in the past, all those promises he gave to Abraham and the others, all the ways God made the nation of Israel, all the ways that he rescued them from slavery in Egypt, how God came and dwelt among them. And of course, it also talks then about how they should live alongside God, how they should live as people who have been rescued by him, that belong to him and bear his name. In other words, the law is telling them about their identity. It's telling them about who they are as well as how they should live. If you like, the path they should take because of who they are. Let me just give you a little example of that. Back in Deuteronomy 26, they're told there they should bring their, when they have a harvest, bring the sort of the the, the first of that harvest before God. And it says this, you shall declare before the Lord your God, my father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the God heard our voice and saw our misery, toil and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. See what's going on there? They're recounting what God has done. They're recounting this past history. This is who they are. They are this people that God has rescued, that God has given everything. Everything they have is a gift from God. And so the most natural thing in the world is to then give a small part of that, as it were, back to God. That makes perfect sense in the light of who they are and what God has done. 
if you like, the life that they live flows out of who they are and what God has done for them. And we need to do the same. We need to make sure that our life, our whole way of thinking, the way the decisions that we make are not shaped by social media or the latest celebrity, but by God's word. God's word is to be in our, in our mouth, it says in verse 8. Don't depart from your mouth. That's interesting. You'd think it'd be in your heart. No, no, your mouth, because we speak it, we teach it, we talk about it. What we talk about shows us what we really treasure, doesn't it? We talk about what interests us. We should talk about God's word. And we will love God by keeping his word central. So when we think about the direction we need for our lives in the midst of change, don't look in the Bible for some sort of grand strategy for your life or for some running commentary on every change and challenge. That's for God to work out. What instead he has revealed to us is, if you like, on what we need to focus on. And what we need to focus on is what I've called here the basics. We need to focus on what God has done to save you. The wonder of belonging to him. We need to focus on living for him, of loving God, loving our neighbor. In whatever situation you're in. So in a way, it doesn't really matter whether you're a chief executive, a factory worker, a mother, or whatever else. How are you following God, serving him, loving him, loving your neighbor in those situations? That's what we need to focus our efforts on. Not how do I give my life the most significance or something. That's, that's for God to work out. You just get on and obey. And it's the same in the church. You know, how are we going to adjust to all the changes upon us? How do we adapt our ministry? You know, do we need some great new strategy? Do we need you know, the next big thing? The next big idea? Well, there's a place for those things. Strategy is not wrong. Joshua was a strategic military genius. There's a place for that. But I would suggest it's a small place. Because fundamentally, we already have what we need in the Bible. So we don't actually need to start organizing revolutions what we need to do is make known the revolutionary gospel. We need to live revolutionary lives as God's revolutionary community. You see, we have a gospel message that is incredible. It says that we are not saved, we are not forgiven by our good works or by being a victim. We are saved through Jesus' wrath-bearing sacrifice on the cross. That puts us all on an equal footing. True equality. That's radical. We are all equally bad. We're all equally in need of a saviour. This is a gospel where we are small and God is big. That's what I mean by the basics. And we need to live out that gospel. It's no good just, just saying that. We actually need to demonstrate it in our lives. So, for example, in the New Testament church, you had the shocking reality that slaves and masters were together as equals in the church. Today, church should be a place of racial and class integration and equality. That's a challenge. That's radical. It needs to be a place of forgiveness, not a place of grudges. A place where we don't gossip, but we speak the truth in love. Well, that's radical, isn't it? You know, the change, sometimes we talk about all the change that's needed in the church, and we, we sort of think about music or a bit more information technology or whatever it might be. But, you know, the most dramatic, radical thing we can do to change the church is to think less about yourself. To be a bit less selfish is incredibly radical. And if we do that... That will impact the society around us. We don't need some great grand scheme. We need to love our neighbor. That's where we begin. 
And we need to be soaked in God's word. Because just like the Israelites were going into a land where people didn't follow God, where they weren't going to be hearing this from the people in, that they were moving amongst, they weren't going to hear about God from them. They needed to know what they believed and why. And it's the same for us. We are going into a, a world where we're not going to hear about God's truth and God's word. So that's why we need to soak ourselves in it in the church, in our time alone. We need that to be able to have the courage to stand out, to be different. We need to know who we are, what God has done, and where we are going. That is how we're going to be equipped for whatever changes there may be. That's how we're going to keep going through what may be many months of meeting like this. That is going to be a challenge. That is going to be hard for us. But everything we need to meet that challenge is found in God's word. But there's a final thing to encourage us. A final thing that gives us this confidence in change, and it's really the most important thing. It's God's presence. Did you see how this promise is repeated? Verse 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Verse 9, do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. And it's a promise you find repeated in Deuteronomy. It's just picked up again here now. And remember, God had been with them already. God had been with them coming out of Egypt. He led them in that cloud and fire coming out of Egypt. He'd pitched his tent amongst them in the wilderness. And now God is just repeating this promise. And I think it's wonderful how he is speaking directly to Joshua. This isn't through some prophet. This is God speaking directly to Joshua to encourage Joshua because God knows the future of God's people rests on the future of Joshua. He is going to lead the people. And he needs a great antidote to fear. He needs to be confident of God's presence. <clears throat> because he's going to have a lot to be afraid of. I mean, Joshua's got to lead the Israelites. Well, that's not an easy job, is it? Moses didn't find that straightforward. And he's also got to fight some big people. People that were fierce warriors like Goliath. That's how we should understand these giants in the land. Lived in fortified cities. And it was a battle that we think of this, oh, it's just, you know, one or two battles. No, no, it was a battle that was going to take a long time. When God says, you know, possess the land, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? No, just possess the land, you know, that's done in a week, isn't it? No, it wasn't. It was done in a lifetime. When God says possess the land, it means hard grinding slog for decades. That's what God had in store for them. You can see why they'd be tempted to be afraid and discouraged. How are they going to keep going? God's presence. And understand what God is promising here. He's not saying, I'll be thinking of you. I'll be praying for you. I'll be rooting from you from the sidelines. That isn't what God means. What he's saying is, I am coming with you. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Well, that's handy in change, isn't it? Because whatever the change may be, wherever it is, God is going to be with you. And he's going to be with you for as long as it takes. And there's no fine print, there's no caveats to this promise. God is going to fight with them. If you read on in chapter 5, you discover that the commander of the army is not Joshua, it's Jesus Christ himself. And there's these lovely words in Deuteronomy 3.22 where it says, God himself will fight for you. God is actually there, really, in the battle. Not simply helping them to fight, but God is actually fighting. So the lesson for us is this. Never think of the Christian life, of facing change in the Christian life, as God sort of saying, you know, here's a map, here's a phone, you know, Ring, ring for help if you get into real trouble and I'll try and sort of parachute some supplies in. That is not living the Christian life. 
this is a better picture of the Christian life. I don't know if you can see that sign. It doesn't show up well on my one here. Um, it's not a sign I'd seen before till we were on holiday. This sign basically is saying, jump off the mountain here. Okay, here's a clue. That's what people were doing next to this sign. They were getting their parachutes out, ready to jump off the mountain. This is a much better picture of the Christian life. Because it's saying that we're doing something difficult, we're doing something scary, but we're doing it strapped to Jesus. Imagine this was you. How afraid would you be up there underneath that parachute? Well, it would basically, I think, depend on how much you trusted the instructor and the equipment. That basically would determine how afraid you were, I think. And let's face it, things can go wrong. Instructors can make mistakes, equipment can fail. But it's different with Jesus. He can't fail. You are strapped to him. You are as secure as him. He is going with you in this sense. In a way, he's really the one carrying us. So it's like the disciples in that boat in the storm. They are as safe as Jesus is. So whatever change you may face as a Christian, you do it with Jesus. You are as safe and as victorious as Jesus. I think that's a reason we can be strong and courageous. This isn't just sort of motivational guff. This is solid reality that can change how we live. And just note the direct connection to Jesus here. That name Joshua is the Hebrew form of the Greek name Jesus. Jesus, if you like, was called Joshua. Joshua was commissioned to lead the people. He was sent by God. If you like, the people's future rested on Joshua. That's why God spends this effort instructing Joshua here. Well, Jesus was sent by his father. He was confident his father was with him. Jesus obeyed perfectly, and he single-handedly fought the fight, defeated Satan, and opened not a promised land, but a whole new creation for his people. You see, the name Joshua, the name Jesus, means God is salvation. So do you trust him. Do you belong to him? Follow him? Because all these things I've said only applies if you do. Without Christ, change is terrifying. And it ultimately leads to an eternity with no change. Under God's judgment forever. The only place we can be safe is with Christ. And if you do trust him, listen to his commission. John 20, 21, as my father has sent me, even so I am sending you. He has his work for us in his kingdom at this time. Let's be strong and courageous and go with him into that work. Let's finish with the words of this hymn. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the weight of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. Through every change, he faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your gracious heavenly friend. Through thorny ways leads to a joyful end. Be still, my soul, your God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the winds and waves still know the voice of Christ that ruled them here below.
Be still, my soul, the day is hastening on when we shall ever be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgotten, love's pure joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past. In his safe presence, we shall meet at last. Let's pray. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. We thank you for that amazing promise. We thank you that you are with us every step of the way. We pray, Father, that you would help us to trust you, to love you, to obey you. Help us, Lord, in whatever the future may bring. May we be faithful to you and may we cling to our Saviour, confident that he is the one who goes before us. He is the one who equips us. He is the one who is with us in every situation. May that encourage us, we pray, and help us to go as you have sent us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.